Hi, today I'd like to talk about Uber, one of my favorite companies, partly because it's given me so many teaching and learning moments just in the last 15 months. It's a company I didn't know much about before June of 2014, and people accuse me of not knowing much about it still. But the first time I heard about Uber was in, in a news story in the Wall Street Journal that said that Uber had raised 17 billion, had raised 1.2 billion from venture capitalists, which put its value around 17 billion. And I was curious. I wanted to find out what made this company so valuable. So having done some very, very basic research on, on how the company operated, what made it tick, I did my initial valuation of Uber. And in my initial valuation of Uber, I described it as an urban car service company. That's the story I told about Uber. An urban car service company with local networking benefits, significant competitive advantages, and essentially a very capital light business model. Now you're going to see the significance of each of these parts of the story when I show you my valuation. In my initial valuation, which I did in June of 2014, the market that I looked at was the urban car service market, about $100 billion. The market share that I gave Uber of this market in steady state 10 years out was 10%. Why only 10%? Because of that local networking benefit part of the story. Essentially, what I'm assuming is that Uber, once it gets to a tipping point in the city, will start to dominate the city. But dominating one city will not give them a step up in other cities. And that at the end game, there will be maybe six or seven or eight or maybe even 10 car service companies, each dominating segments of the world. That was my assumption. You can disagree with it, but that gave me my end market share. I left Uber's slice of its gross billing, which was 20% in 2014 and continues to be 20% today, at 20% for the entire period. That's a competitive advantage is kicking in. And I also left its cost structure at a relatively restrained level. I allowed it to have an, an operating margin of 40% because they operate in a bare bones infrastructure. With those assumptions in place, the value that I got for Uber was $6 billion. Now, of course, that's much lower than $17 billion. And I heard a lot from venture capitalists and, and lots of people in Silicon Valley. And many of, the, many of the critiques basically said, you have no business valuing this company. You really don't understand technology companies. And discounted cash flow models are not the mechanism for valuing these companies. I will forever be grateful for, to Bill Gurley, who is one of the early investors in Uber, who took the time out to actually pen a counter-narrative. And in the counter narrative, he told me what I had assumed that he disagreed with. First, he said, Uber is not just an urban company. It's going to be everywhere, like Serbia, suburbia, small towns, even villages. He said, it's not just a car service company. It's a logistics company. And he also made the argument that it had the pieces in place to have global networking benefits, that with its partnerships, with credit card companies and other businesses, it could actually tip the scales and become a global networking benefit company. Market share 30, 40, maybe even 50 percent. I read his narrative and I was fascinated. I mean, clearly he knows a lot more about the company than I do. And I decided to revalue the company using his narrative. And essentially in, in his narrative, here's what I did differently. I made the market size a much bigger market. I gave it a, a, I gave Uber a $300 billion potential market reflecting the bigger narrative. The end market share, I let, it, I, I let go to 40%, the global networking benefits. The rest of the valuation pretty much stayed in place, but the end value for Uber that I got with Bill Gurley's narrative was $53 billion. Much, much bigger than $6 billion, right? And I heard a lot of blowback again, this time from my value investing friend saying, hey, how can the intrinsic value of a company jump from 6 to $53 billion? And my response was, with young young startups, early stage companies, this should not be surprising because narrative drives value. And if there's lots of room for different narratives, there should be lots of room for different values. In fact, in December of 2014, I decided to put this into practice with Uber by letting my readers actually value Uber on their own, by letting them pick the narrative. I let them pick what kind of business Uber was in, uh, an urban car service, total car service, logistics, transportation, I let them pick what kind of networking benefits they saw Uber having, local, none, global, what kind of competitive advantage, strong, semi-strong, weak, none. And I valued Uber with each of these choices, and I got values ranging from less than a billion to close to 100 billion. Amazing, right? But that's what different narratives will do. Now, it's been nine months since I did that original valuation, and lots of orders flowed under the bridge, lots of news stories about Uber. In fact, this is a company that seems incapable of going a week without getting in the news. And with these news stories, you get a, you, you, the reactions you get reflect where you come from, what kind of priors you have on Uber. Thus, if you like Uber, 
Whenever you read a good news story, it's to you greasing the path to a $100 billion, billion dollar IPO. If it's a bad news story and you're a pessimist, you're convinced that this is the end of Uber. To me, these news stories are fascinating because they feed into my narrative. They teach me what I don't know about the future and maybe let me adapt my narrative. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the news stories I've read about Uber in the last nine months, and it's probably not a complete, I've probably missed a few, and look at how they've changed or not changed my initial narrative for Uber. The first set of stories that I looked at were stories about the total market, the car service market. And here's what I, the stories told me. First, they said this market is going to be much broader than I thought it was. Clearly, the story I told about Uber being an urban car service company was too narrow. Uber is in suburbia, it's in exurbia, it's even starting to show up in towns where I never thought it would show up. It's bigger. It's bigger in what sense it's starting to attract in customers who otherwise would not have taken cabs, maybe even mass transit users. And the evidence for this is a little indirect. It comes from a leaked report from Uber, take it with, for, with a grain of salt because it's leaked, about what's happened in San Francisco, the, mar the, the city where car service companies have the, lo have the longest history now, Uber, Lyft, and a few others have their starts in San Francisco. And in San Francisco alone, these companies collectively now have a market that's three times larger than the original taxi cab market was in San Francisco. Now, San Francisco might be unique, but clearly these companies are pulling in users who otherwise would not have used a cab, would not have gone used a limo service. And that's partly because they're offering more diverse choices. Uber, for instance, has come up with Uber Pool that lets you essentially spend a lot less than you'd have spent to get your own car, but effectively that might be the reason they're attracting mass transit customers. The other piece of news that's come out about the market is it's become a lot more global. In fact, the big news about the growth in this market is coming out of Asia, and in particular India and China, and that should come as no surprise. If you think about the trifecta you need to be a successful car service business, you need lots of people. Asia has that. You need lots of these people to not have cars. Asia has that. And you need bad mass transit systems, and India at least definitely has that. No, no wonder the future in terms of car service growth is coming out of Asia. Now, there is some bad news about the total market, and most of it has taken the form of regulatory bans that have been put on car service companies generally, and Uber specifically, in cities around the world, maybe even entire countries. In fact, Sao Paulo was the latest city to add to that mix by banning Uber. Car, uh, cab drivers, not surprisingly, are also not happy. They've gone on strikes in London, Paris. But the reason there's a tinge of good news, even to this bad news, is they would not be reacting this strongly if Uber and the other car service companies were not eating their lunch. In fact, there's some, there's some, there's some evidence on the ground that is much stronger than anything you see in terms of regulatory news stories. And here's what it is. In New York City alone, the receipts that, that yellow cabs are getting are down 10 to 15 percent just in the last year. More importantly, the market price of a, med of a cab medallion, which is what you need to operate a yellow cab in New York City, is down about 40 percent. That's a $5 billion drop in market cap in cab medallions just in the last two years. Something's going on under the surface and the market is voting with its feet. In fact, there's even talk that auto sales might see ahead. It's not happened yet, but somewhere along the line, car service is changing the transportation story. So overall, here's what I've learned about the market. The market's going to be much bigger, much broader, much more global than I thought it was going to be in 2014. And there's one final piece of, piece of one final story that adds to, the, to this conviction. As I said, almost everything you read about Uber's financials are leaked. And one of the financials that got leaked in the last few weeks was from a presentation that was being made, not by Uber, but by somebody on behalf of Uber raising money from investors. And essentially, it put the gross billing, this is not the revenue, but the gross billing, this is the, the total amount that you collect, the taxi cabs, have, that the Uber cars have collected in 2015 at more than 10 billion, 10.84 billion. If that is true or even close to true, true that is astonishing. It's a fourfold increase in market from last year. So the market's growing a lot faster and it's much bigger than we thought it was or I thought it was 15 months ago. Now in terms of the news on competition, the news is a little more mixed. The good news front, the cost of entry has gone up. Car service companies have raised the ante. They've made it more expensive to get into this business. If you want to enter into a new city, you better have lots of cash to throw around to get new drivers, to get them to come to you. 
As a consequence, you haven't seen a lot of new new companies enter this space. So in fact, the number of competitors has, has leveled off, at least in the US. And in the US, it's actually become a two-player game for the most part, Uber and Lyft. Outside the US, especially in the big growth markets, India, China, and Southeast Asia, you have intense competition from local players. It's Ola in India, Didi Kwadi in, Ch in China, and Grab Taxi in Southeast Asia. And each of these companies has access to capital that allows them to compete head-to-head -head against Uber. So the good news for Uber is that the number of competitors they're going to be fighting with are not going to be dozens and dozens. The bad news is the competition is going to be a lot more intense, which is going to put pressure on two things. One is it's going to put pressure on that 80-20 breakdown that we've had of billings. That the 20% goes to the car service company, that's going to come under pressure. The second place that you're going to see this happen is perhaps in, that, in those operating margins that you see at Uber and the other car service companies, you're going to see pressure downwards on those numbers. In fact, it's on the margin that, are, that the next set of stories center. And here's where the most bad news has come out in the, in the last nine months. The cost structure for car service companies is becoming more onerous. There are more expenses than we thought there were going to be on several fronts. First is an internally imposed problem, which is these car service companies are so intensely competitive that they offer that to get drivers to sign up, they're offering signing bonuses, they're offering them money to come over from another car service company. And that's adding up to a lot of expenditure. Now, the, the good news on that expenditure, perhaps, is as you, as you get to a networking benefit, perhaps this cost will fall out. But there are two other costs that are not going to go away. One is, you know, and, and this is coming from the regulatory and the legal side, as much as it's coming from within the business. For the longest time, car service companies have treated, or for their entire lifetimes, car service companies have treated drivers as independent contractors. Now, that's starting to change. The California Labor Board a few months ago decided that an Uber driver was an employee. Now, this, got, this of course, is going to get litigated, but a court also decided a few weeks ago that Uber drivers can collectively sue Uber in a class action lawsuit. Both those things indicate to me that it's sooner or later that Uber drivers are going to have are no longer going to be independent contractors. They might not be full employees, but there's going to be some intermediate role they're going to play, maybe partial employees with some of the costs associated with employees. That's going to push up the cost for car service companies. The other cost that's going to become an increasingly large cost is the insurance cost. Now, when car service companies first got started, people driving for them were able to use essentially a blind spot in insurance rules to keep their existing insurance and add a supplemental insurance. I have a feeling that insurance companies and regulators are going to design new insurance policies just for car service company drivers. And those costs are going to be at least par either partially or fully borne by the car service companies. Overall, the news indicates to me that looking forward, you should expect to see the operating margins at car service companies become smaller. Now, they're right now negative, but the end margins become smaller relative to what, the, what I thought they were going to be in June of 2014. Now, the capital intensity of the business has not changed. It's still a low capital intensity business. None of the car service companies have opened the door to owning the cars or building significant infrastructure. But, and this may just be me, but it looks to me like this is on the surface, that things are changing under the surface. For instance, there's a new story that Uber has essentially bid away the entire robotics department of, the Con of Carnegie Mellon now to work at Uber. Now, I'm not sure what they're working on, but to me it seems to be that there is change on the way where car service companies looking for competitive edges, edges are going to have to invest more capital than they have historically. For the moment, I'm going to leave the capital intensity on change, but this is a model in flux and it will change. Now, in terms of management culture, lots of stories about Uber. And here, what you read and how you react will very much depend on what you think about Uber as a company. If you like Uber as a company, the news stories you read about Uber will lead you to think of it as a brash, aggressive company that goes for what it wants. And you know, if you don't like the company, you view it as an arrogant company that essentially plays with the rules and doesn't care about people. Now, I'm not going to essentially piss off either of you by taking your side or, or going against you. But I think that management culture is going to be an issue going forward with Uber. And I think, it, at least as somebody who lives in New York City, I saw this play out when Uber fought New York City over the last few months. A few months ago, the mayor of our city, Mayor de Blasio, decided that 
you know, in, in conjunction with the city council, that he was going to restrain Uber, stop Uber from expanding. It looked like a fait accompli that nobody was going to be able to stop them. Uber decided to take on the mayor and the city council head on. And in fact, one of the things that they, one of the ploys that they used, which I thought is very clever, though not necessarily good in the long term, was they added a de Blasio option to Uber. You know how when you go to Uber, you can look at UberX and Uber. You, they added a de Blasio button. If you hit the de Blasio button, it said there are no cars available in the city, essentially telling Uber drivers that if Uber were banned or restricted, that they would lose that car service. They won that battle. That's tough to do in New York City. But the question is, did they burn enough? Did, did, have, they, have they made this process so poisonous that they can't go back to these regulators and, and politicians in the future? I don't know, but it remains a, 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 the part of the company that is still a wild card in the company. So I decided to revisit my valuation, given all the news that I've read about the company. So here's what I did. First, I replaced my urban car service assumption with the assumption that Uber is going to become a logistics company. You've seen some of this already starting, the nascent parts of it in L.A. with Uber Eats and Uber Move. But I'm assuming that that's the end market. Instead of a 10% market share, which is what I visualized in June of 2014, the fact that there are fewer competitors and the fact that Uber is everywhere allows me now to give them a, at least a weak global networking benefit. Weak in what sense? I'm not going to go 50% because I think in Asia they're going to still have to fight this in country after country, city after city with the local car companies with the rules tilted perhaps in favor of the local companies. But I used a 25% market share instead of the original assumption I made of a 10% market share. I'm going to also assume that Uber is going to be able to keep expanding the market, that they will double the size of this market by bringing in new users over the next 10 years. And I am going to become a little more pessimistic on a couple of assumptions. First is I'm going to assume the 20% slice that Uber has been able to keep will come under pressure and drop to 15%. And that because of the additional costs coming from regulation and legal issues, that their cost structure will have to reflect that. The margins of being 40% will be 25%. I've lowered the cost of capital because I think Uber has moved a little farther down the cycle towards becoming a safer company. And I've eliminated the probability that they will cease to exist. They have enough access to capital and cash to survive. And the end result of these assumptions is a value of about $23.4 billion. So I've almost quadrupled my value. In fact, if you want to see a bigger picture of the value, that's basically what I've done in this page, is I've laid out my assumptions in an Excel spreadsheet showing them. And, and because I've allowed for a bigger market and growth in that market, you look at the end number, 2025, I'm estimating a total market of 618 billion and a 25% market share. And with my assumptions, bringing them all back to the present, you can see the assumptions connected to the numbers. The value that I get is 23.4 billion. Now, having once once you read this, the one thing I hope you don't do is agree with me entirely because I fail. In fact, I hope that one of that you fall into one of three groups. The first is that you think my value is too high, and maybe I'm being too optimistic. If you think my value is too high, I hope that you disagree with me for the right reasons. What are the wrong reasons? I hope you don't think the value is too high because it's a money losing company. It's, it, should, it should be a money losing company. It's a growth company or that it trades at a high multiple of revenues or that it doesn't fit into a dividend discount model. Those are not the reasons. Reasons you should think my value is too high is because I've overestimated the market size or maybe I'm being too optimistic about the market share or that I'm being too optimistic about the cost structure. In other words, go in and change one of those levers. If you think my value is too low, don't blame the discounted cash flow model. It's not the model that's at fault. It's me. Perhaps my vision is too cramped. Maybe there's an even bigger market that I'm not seeing, a larger market share, a better cost structure. Maybe that's the reason my value is too low. And if you think I don't, I'm not, a, if your problem with this valuation is because I'm not a tech person, that I don't know much about the car service business, and, and or that I'm not a venture capitalist who made tons of money, I'm guilty on every count. But even if those reasons are true, that doesn't mean that you can't replace my inputs with your inputs, which should be much better than mine, given that I don't know much about the business. So that's part of the reason I put up the Excel spreadsheet with my valuation and the levers are there for you. And in fact, I would love it if you could go in and change the numbers and give me your valuation of the company. But as I said at the start of this process, Uber has become one of my favorite companies. 
And the best part for me is the story continues. I wake, uh, I wake up, I open up the newspaper tomorrow, there'll be another story about Uber. The game continues. It's the gift that keeps on giving. It's a narrative that's going to keep changing. And I'm sure I'll be back to you in six months or a year with another valuation of Uber that's very different from maybe the 23.4 billion. And maybe, maybe, given the talk about the IPO, I will be able to give you my estimate of value at the time of the IPO. And to show you how much Uber has started to seep into my personal life, I'll, I'll finish with the story. It's about, uh, uh, it was last summer, summer of 2014, about three months after my Uber post, August of 2014. My son, who was then 15, had a friend over to play. He had a friend over to play in the afternoon. And the time for the friend to be picked up to go home came about at about 6 o'clock. And I looked out of the, of the window expecting the typical transportation in the middle of suburbia, which is where I live for a 15-year-old, which is what I call the mom car. Mom pulls up in the car and takes her son home. I looked out and a, and a strange sedan pulls up with a bearded guy in the driver's seat. And I said, this isn't... So I turned to my son's friend and said, this isn't your mom, who's this? And he said, that's an Uber car. And my first reaction was, I've got to go back and redo my valuation of Uber. And here's why. In my June 2014 valuation of Uber, if you remember, I described Uber as an urban car service company. And here... I've evidence right in front of me, in the middle of suburbia, that it's not just an urban car service company. Of such actions are built obsessions. So I'll keep coming back to this valuation in future years, and I hope you enjoyed this session. Thank you for listening.